The Cube at OpenStack Summit Atlanta 2014 is brought to you by Brocade. Say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. And Red Hat. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Atlanta for the OpenStack Summit. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angel, and my host, Stu Miniman of Wikibon.org. Our next guest is Sage Wheel, founder, chairman, and CTO of Ink Tank. Um, company's doing some great work and all of a sudden gets bought by Red Hat and now mm -hmm. everyone wants to talk to you. You're uh, <laughs> it's popular. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Good to um, be here. It's always good to see an acquisition happen when you have such a good partner with Red Hat. Obviously, Red Hat's been great sponsoring the Cube this week. A shout mm -hmm. out to those guys. Really, you know, Linux has just become such mainstream part of the culture these days, and mm -hmm. you know, it was just an alternative in the past, a cheap alternative to the, the big guys, and now it's obviously an industry. Um, I'll get you. So I'm going to get your perspective on mm -hmm. what you guys have done. So tell us, how did all this go down? Obviously, you just you're minding your own business, <laughs> doing your doing your thing, and then all of a sudden, knock thing, on the door. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Yeah, tell us a story. Yeah, so, I mean, Ceph is a, is a pretty old project. We've been working on this for, um, well, me, almost 10 years now. Um, Ink Tank is about two years old, um, so it, was, it became clear at some point that we really needed a, a commercial organization to support the engineering effort behind Ceph and to support customers who are trying to deploy it. Um, and we were, you know, doing very well. We were sort of in the process um, at this two-year point, point of raising a round of capital um, when Red Hat came knocking, sort of unsolicited, and uh, it, was, it, it turned out to be a very good opportunity for us. Um, and it went down a, pretty fast? It was, it was a very fast deal, yeah. <laughs> um, and Red Hat is a great open source company. Um, it's sort of one of the only companies that I really feel comfortable selling to in the first place. So um, the timing just worked out. Yeah, Red Hat's got a good culture. And you know, I, I always kind of like needle a little bit. They kind of do more of their marketing. But that's not the way you do it in open source. It's you, you market with your code, mm -hmm. especially in a noisy world like OpenStack right now. It's pretty noisy it's here. Very noisy, I mean, yeah. What's your take on the scene here? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's madness. I think, I think OpenStack is, a, is an interesting project because um, there are so many companies involved and there's so much marketing budget, frankly, um, that it, it is a little bit difficult sometimes to filter out all the signal from the noise. Um, but I think, I think at the end of the day, you have to look at the people who are doing the actual work, who are actually deploying to real customers and who are actually contributing the code. On that, that well, certainly Red Hat well. sees greatness in the queue. We thank it for mm -hmm. the sponsorship, but we mm -hmm. were just commenting on our opening about Red Hat having that pole position, kind of using the, the NASCAR analogy there. You know, the race <laughs> hasn't even started yet, but if you look at what Linux is doing right now, yeah. Red Hat has a deep bench in terms of what they have to offer while everyone's mm -hmm. kind of jockeying, and Stu and I will always watch the cars on the track, if you will, but you know, the thing is, is that I don't even think the game has started yet, and I asked no, everyone yesterday that same question, they're like, it's still early, early. It just seems like it just hasn't started yet. There's no, sh the shot's not fired yet. This, the gun hasn't gone off. I mean, do you agree? Um, I, I don't have a real strong opinion around the OpenStack space, frankly. Um, I think if you look at sort of the broader computing ecosystem, and Linux in particular, I think one of the great things about open source is because you have all of these open projects, you have a lot of infrastructure that makes it very easy for people to bootstrap, um, you know, real products that add real value um, on top of these, on top of all these projects. So. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, um, and there's a lot of room for people to really innovate and, and make a mark for themselves. Yeah. So, so I don't, so I don't see a foregone conclusion being, you know, any, yeah. any particular. Company it's clear that everyone online, likes OpenStack. It's packed house, yeah. and there's a lot of work going on. It's not yeah. like it's a, it's yeah. not a lot of fluff here in terms of, you know, people just waving yeah. their hands. They actually are doing okay. some work. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of. Yeah, so Sage, I'm wondering if you can help dig into a, for, for us uh, kind of an open source project versus the productization. So, you know, obviously yes. you said Seth's been around for 10 years, mm -hmm. Ink Tank only the last two. Obviously, Red Hat mm -hmm. has a long history in this space, and, and yeah. it's what everybody's trying to do. So, so what, mm -hmm. what, what, what advice do you give, and you know, what's your experience been? Um, I think there, there are a couple different models, and, and people go down different paths. Um, in, our, in our case, we, we made a, a very conscious, deliberate decision to separate Ceph the project from Ink Tank the company. Um, because we felt that it was critical, particularly for something as important as storage, um, to build an open platform that lots of different organizations are contributing to. You have to have a robust ecosystem of um, lots of partners and people who are building on top of that, of that code. And when you sort of try to, con try to when, you're, when you're starting a company, you can sort of name the company after the project and you can get this sort of initial um, momentum based on that. But in the end, you're sort of starving out the ecosystem in the long run. Um, and so I think the, some of the most successful projects make that separation. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's, it's also it's 
the open source business model is a very tough one to crack. There aren't a lot of companies that have been like, you know, wildly successful in doing it. Um, and so you also see a lot of patterns where you have companies that you know go with the separate branding, for example, and after a while sort of merge them again. You know, that happens with Mongo, and it happened with um, um, Chef and, and others. And that's you know sometimes that works for them, sometimes it doesn't. So I think there's you know there's no sort of one right way to do it. Um, I think it really depends on what your goals are. All right. How about Ceph and OpenStack? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of storage projects out there. You know, are you guys contributing? You know, where, where, where do you fit in the OpenStack ecosystem? Um, well, we're we're definitely invested in making Ceph, um, you know, a, a storage platform that platform that works very well with OpenStack, um, and we we've invested pretty heavily in making that that work um, as part of Inktake's sort of business strategy because of the the traction that OpenStack um, was getting and and. Specifically, um, when our when our sort of end goal is, is getting Ceph into the enterprise, uh, we see a lot of, a lot of um, organizations that are deploying private clouds based on OpenStack, and having that be sort of the, the Trojan horse to get into the organization, um, instead of going head to head with you know a you know a, a SAN solution or something like that and trying to try to compete with them directly, um, you want to get into the cases that are more greenfield, um, where you can get in the door and get um, administrators and IT departments comfortable with your technology, and then then expand from there. Right. Anything you could share about specific deployments, or you know, what, what are the customers seeing when they're trying to pair up OpenStack and stuff? Um, I think they're seeing good things. Um, I, you should look at the <laughs> look at the OpenStack user survey to see what kind of traction we're getting. Um, Ceph is one of the most common storage platforms behind OpenStack, if not the most common. I haven't looked at the latest stats yet um, for this particular round. Um, so overall, I think I think people are sort of seeing the value of having you know an open software defined um, storage platform that they can run a commodity hardware and build their clouds out. Um, you know, when, when people sort of buy into the cloud thesis, they're realizing that um, it's not about buying these monolithic systems. Um, it's really about, you know, having something that's, that scales, um, you know, horizontally and that you can deploy, um, you know, as you need more resources. And once you sort of buy into that thesis, then, then systems like Ceph um, that are, I hate the term, but software defined, I mean, in that sense, are a perfect fit, and so it's, it's a very easy sell in that case. Why do you uh, hate that term, yeah, software defined? Yeah. It's <laughs> because it's, it's, it's meaningless. All, yeah. all, all storage systems are built with hardware and software, so there's a software component in everything. Um, I, think, I think that the key distinction that- It's always really been software defined, then. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. It's, 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 it, you know, every, every vendor is, is trying to define software defined to be what they're selling, whether it's, a, it's an API that's open, or whether they're plugging into an open API, or whether it's the, the platform itself is open. Right. Yeah, so, Jeremy so Burton said from EMC, yeah. that don't fight fashion. So yeah. if people want to come on, if that's what's fashion, you know, hey, it's yeah. called software defined. All right. yeah, so, yeah, technically it's software it, yeah. defined, right? Yeah. That's convenient for them, I suppose. So yeah. Sage, I've got a better term for you there then. You so Wikibon, we actually, we originally called it software-led infrastructure, and mm -hmm. what we actually came up with earlier this year is what we call server SAN. So server SAN mm -hmm. is a scalable architecture that allows you to take compute and storage and scale it out. Mm -hmm. And we listed there are kind of appliances that do this, there are software products, and then there's data services. And mm -hmm. uh, Ceph is actually one of the data services yeah. that can help build those environments so um, yeah. you know can, can you talk a little bit about you know you know helping to build that that next generation you know kind of scalable architecture uh, it's a very different challenge than to traditional storage yes absolutely um, yeah so I'm you want to hear about what what Seth did I guess yeah um, so in our case the the sort of the, the motivations for the system were to build something that runs on commodity hardware and had no, no single point of failure um, so instead of investing in um, sort of traditional HA environments where you have to have specialized backend SANs where you have cross-connected hosts and all, all that all that stuff to do, um, sort of more of the traditional HA architectures, instead of having to invest in that type of hardware infrastructure, you can buy sort of commodity off-the-shelf stuff. Um, and you're handling all, all of the complexity of replication and failure detection in software. Um, and so you sort of remove the dependency on the hardware. So we like the term um, hardware agnostic. Um, not that the hardware doesn't matter because it makes a huge difference whether you're running on you know, the cheapest SATA disks you can find or high-end you know, PCI attached flash or whatever. Um, but the idea is that the, the software component, um, you know, the Ceph bits, um, are the same in either case. It's really just a matter of what your performance um, you know, cost, reliability, trade-offs. Yeah, so I mean, there's a real discussion point in the industry as to you know where do the services live. If you mm -hmm. look at you know the, the the big web guys, they really let the application take care of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, virtualization has built a lot of things into the hypervisor layer, mm -hmm. um, and some some software pieces uh, you know just take care of things like replication, um, exactly. you know, without going with traditional RAID. Mm -hmm. So you know, w w where do you see all this playing out? You know, what 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 is the role of storage going forward? Yeah, I, I think you're going to see a mix, honestly. So. Uh, 
this is probably not, not what I should be saying, but you're not going to see a sort of a one size fits all. You know, as much as we like to think that Ceph is going to be a, a, is a very flexible platform that you can use a lot of these different environments, there are cases where it doesn't make sense. There are cases where you have a, an application that's architected from the top down to, 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 um, to tolerate failure. And in that case, you can have all your, you know, your web instances, whatever, in the cloud running on ephemeral storage, and that's just fine because you architected it that way. Um, in other situations, you have legacy applications that, that assume that the storage is reliable. Um, and so you need to, to sort of build in that reliability and fault tolerance from the bottom up. Um, I think one of the, the powerful things about Ceph is that we, have, we expose APIs at a number of different layers. And so you can get sort of different levels of complexity in your API. Um, and having sort of that, that basic notion that you have a pool of storage um, that is, that's strongly consistent um, and durable and highly available um, is a hugely liberating just building block upon which to build other systems. So instead of having to worry about a lot of that complexity, you can focus on you know, everything that happens above, above yeah. the storage layer. So, so, so uh, obviously not every solution is going to fit you know, for all environments. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if we look at Red Hat, you know, you're not the first acquisition uh, that they've made yeah. in the storage space. Mm -hmm. can, can you give us a little bit of uh, you know, wh wh where do you know, Ceph and Gluster fit uh, you know, in, in that solution set? Um, yeah, so I mean, today, today um, Ink Tank is, is um, selling an enterprise distribution of Ceph that focuses on the object and block use cases. Um, and OpenStack is a big piece of that. That's like 70% you know, of our, our customer base, but we also have people sort of using um, Ceph in other contexts. Um, Red Hat is primarily selling Gluster in the, in the file space. Um, and so just from a, from a current product perspective, there's, there's actually not a lot of overlap. Um, looking forward, and both technologies are very flexible and allow you to sort of use them in different ways. And so, you know, Gluster can do object block and file and Ceph can do object block and file. Um, but I think that the key thing is that the architectures are, are pretty different um, internally and they speak to different use cases as a result. There are different um, types of applications that they'll perform better for um, and are better suited for. Um, and one of the nice things about this acquisition, honestly, um, is that we're sort of not forced to compete at a business level, which means that the engineering teams can sort of focus on making their technology play well to the use cases that they're, they're best suited for. Yeah, can, can you speak to some of the top use cases that you're seeing from kind of the ink tank side? Yeah. Um, well, today, um, we see a lot of um, block storage in the OpenStack context. I think that's probably one of our, our strongest places. Um, we also see a lot of object storage. Um, so the Ceph is interesting in that we provide actually two object APIs. One of them is a, a RESTful interface that gives you S3 and Swift semantics. Um, and we see, a lot of, we see that used a lot in the context of OpenStack clouds because people want to run like, the, same, the same storage infrastructure that's backing both their compute and their object storage. It's just a, a simpler deployment story. Um, but we also expose a, a lower level um, object API called Liberatus that all these other services are built on internal, internally. Um, and we also see that um, being used in sort of um, larger web shops and people building their own sort of um, web scale applications. So we have a number of customers who have Dropbox-like services that they, they build all the front-facing file sync stuff and they're using Rados as the back-end um, storage. Um, we see big web shots doing um, you know, image, you know, image sites that are storing you know, tens, hundreds of petabytes of um, photos and so forth that are, that are using Rados as the back-end. Um, and the, the new version of Ceph supports erasure coding now. Um, and so that's, that's sort of adding a new um, a new factor into the equation for the, the total cost analysis and so forth. So, um, what's your take on the open source movement as it, as it evolves? I mean, we we always comment on this, and we just want to get people in in the trenches. Mm -hmm. um, everything's out in the open now. A little bit different mm -hmm. than the old days. You you know, post code and then you know reviewed it in committees and there's different governance models. But but what what do you see changing in open source for the positive, and what do you see that's concerning you? Um, I see open source being embraced um, wholeheartedly in the enterprise, which is a, a huge change even from, from five years ago. Um, we had a recent conversation with um, a CIO of a, a, major, a major bank, um, and they were saying that, that um, five years ago we wouldn't have gotten the door. We couldn't have even talked to them. Um, and today they have a, a mandate across the company to adopt open source, which is a world of difference, I think, for organizations, especially like Ink Tank, who are just trying to get plugged into these enterprises. What do you think the reason for that is? More, and more access to developers, or just better code? Um, I think it's. I think it's. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's both of those things. Um, honestly, I think it's. It's a cost thing, though. I think organizations are realizing um, that open source development is just simply a more efficient way to build software, um, and particularly for for a buyer, um, avoiding some of the lock-in that you get with particular vendors means that you have a choice of a choice of um, hardware vendors um, and. If it's open source software, you typically have a choice of different organizations you can go to to support it. Or if you're at a large enough scale, you can support it yourself, which is what usually what the web shops do. do. Yeah, so we were kind of um, teasing that out yesterday. We were talking to some other folks around. There's a lot of vertical applications. There's no mm -hmm. more general purpose yeah. computing architecture anymore, or computing software. Right. You, you know, in the old days, buy a shrink wrap package, install it on, on, a, on a mini computer or whatever. That's yeah. changed a lot now. Do you agree? 
Yes. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Well, what's the most exciting thing about the merger that, or the uh, acquisition that you guys have, uh, <laughs> that your team is, you just is it, have, have kicked in yet? Have you realized yeah. it? Have you pinched yourself? It's, you kick it's yourself? early days. I haven't gotten my red hat yet, so <laughs> I'm, I'm holding out for that. Um, no, I think, I think the most exciting for me, um, thing for me is a couple of things. One is just the idea of being able to bring the resources of a larger organization to bear on a project like Seth that I think you know, has, has a lot of potential. And I, I think the biggest thing is that um, you know, the storage industry as a whole is really ripe for the taking. You see, you know, you see, you saw a huge transformation in, in servers and compute with Linux um, over the past decade, and that, that same transformation hasn't yet happened in storage. And if how, how big is the team? Enormous, how big is your team now? Opportunity. Um, Ink Tank was 50 um, when we were acquired, so. And you're looking to raise around what is add staff, add more developers. What yeah, all of, yeah, all of the above. above. And Red Hat yeah. said we can help you there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's going to be a similar resource investment either way, but we have sort of the larger organization efficiencies and so forth to bring to bear. Sage, my so final question for you. I want you to tell the folks in your own words, why is this year, 2014, in the tech business so buzzed up and so exciting? What, what's going on? What, what, what is getting everyone all jazzed up? What's happening this year that's so game changing? <laughs> is this going to be the year of OpenSAC? <laughs> or the, the year of Linux? No, just stuff? in general. I no, mean, the computing I think, trends, I mean, yeah, you see I a lot of action going on. <laughs> Certainly, you know, mm -hmm. mobile's obvious, right? But I mean, yeah. you know, certain frothy marketplace, a lot of developer, yeah. a lot of developer action going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I have a bit of a bit of tunnel vision because I'm sort of focused on the storage space. But I think in that, in this particular environment, um, I see huge opportunities. I see we're, we're just turning the corner and <laughs> seeing some widespread adoption of, of software-based storage platforms, and I think it's going to be, it's going to bring out a, a huge change. So Sage, well, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, congratulations on uh, the Red Hat deal. This is theCUBE, extracting yeah. the signal from the noise. We'll be right back after this short break.